Many people fundamentally misunderstand how copyright works and will find themselves unwittingly and inadvertently in breach of copyright, perhaps just by posting a photograph online or by printing out a new copy. So today I thought I'd run through a few fundamentals about copyright, photographs, who is the author and what rights are attached to the copyright. But first of all, if you're new to my channel, I'm a barrister who helps you understand law, so make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on future videos. And if you haven't seen my new segment, Questions in the Comments yet, over at Black Belt Secrets, make sure you subscribe there at the link below, because I'm answering your questions in the comments over at Black Belt Secrets. So for the purposes of this video, I'm going to talk about copyright in respect of a photograph or an image, whether that be taken by a camera or created digitally. And even before that, I think it's important to understand what copyright means and why copyright exists in the first place. Essentially, you should think of photographs and digital images as a form of intellectual property. In other words, there will be an owner, and that owner will own certain rights in respect of it. Fundamentally, the copyright owner will own the exclusive rights to reproduce the image, copy the image, print the image, adapt the image, sell the image, license the image, and so on. If somebody else or a company is found to be doing any of these things without the permission of the copyright owner, then there are various remedies and damages available for breach of copyright. They will include an injunction to prevent further copies and potentially damages if there's been a loss of profits for the exploitation of the intellectual property without the permission or license of the copyright owner. And it's worth pointing out at this point that there are lots of myths that fly around on the internet that suggest that perhaps if you alter 30% or three things about the image or the photograph or whatever it is, that you will avoid copyright restrictions. As I said, this is just a myth, this is not true, because one of the exclusive rights of the copyright owner is to make adaptations of the original work. So with that said, let's look at how the owner of copyright is determined, and some of these things may very well surprise you. So let's take one or two scenarios. Let's say you're walking down the street with your boyfriend or girlfriend, and you would like a photograph of the two of you out in the sunshine together next to a lovely lake. You see a passerby and you ask him or her whether they would mind taking a photograph for you on this lovely day out. Think about this scene for a moment and drop a comment below as to who you think owns the copyright in that photograph. Is it you? Or is it your boyfriend or girlfriend? Or is it the passerby who's helped you to take the photograph? Think about this in the scenario as well. Does it matter whether or not the passerby has never used a camera before but you tell him or her how to use it? Or let's switch that out and let's say the passerby happens to be a world-renowned professional photographer. Does this make any difference to your answer? Some of you may have even have thought that it's the manufacturer of the camera because it's the camera that has saved this digital image inside the camera. Now with one or two exceptions, the first owner of copyright is going to be the person or entity that first created the work in a permanent form. So applying this understanding to our scenario, the passerby is going to be the first owner of copyright, subject to any conversations you've had with him or her about whether or not you will be transferred the exclusive copyright ownership because he or she is taking the photograph for you. But I doubt that you're having such conversations about copyright when you're asking someone to take a photograph for you. Because let's expand that scenario a little bit further. Let's say the photograph is absolutely fantastic and you use that photograph to generate a substantial income. Now, whether or not the passerby had never used a camera before or whether they were a professional photographer, they are entitled to any profits generated by this photograph because they will be the copyright owner unless you've agreed otherwise. The same is true if you and your boyfriend or girlfriend have decided to get married or to register a civil partnership, and you commission a professional photographer to come and take photographs of the ceremony for you. Again, in that scenario, and in the absence of any agreement that copyright transfers to you, which is unlikely, then the photographer is going to be the first owner of copyright, not you or anyone else who's commissioned those photographs on your behalf. This is why it's very important when you commission a photographer to come and do work for you to understand exactly what rights you will have going forward. For example, the photographer may charge you a fee to come and shoot the event and a fee to print an initial set of photographs. However, further additional or modified copies will probably attract another fee and require permission from the photographer. And as another piece of trivia, whilst you might often see the copyright symbol, which is a C inside a circle, 
which usually tells you that the work is copyrighted, it doesn't actually have any statutory legal effect. So when you want to use a photograph, perhaps to create additional copies, the basic position is you must seek permission from the copyright owner. But just to make this a little bit more complicated, there are scenarios where there can be more than one copyright owner to a single image and permission would be required from each of the copyright owners within that image to do any of the acts which are restricted for exclusive rights of the copyright owners. For example, let's switch out our original scenario so that you are no longer by a lake. Now you're in a modern art museum and there's lots of lovely pieces of modern art inside this gallery and again you ask a passerby to take your photograph. Now in addition to all the original complications, let's say you are now standing in front of a very famous art piece. Obviously there's going to be copyright ownership in that original art piece that is incidentally caught in your photograph. Now in this scenario many of the astute law students will shout at the screen section 31 of the Copyright Designs and Patent Act 1988 which says that incidental inclusion of a copyrighted work does not infringe copyright. But as always with law it's never quite that simple. The Court of Appeal was called upon to consider this very issue and like many other things in law decided that what was incidental depends on all of the circumstances of the case. In other words there'll be a very big difference between you and your boyfriend or girlfriend standing in the middle of an art gallery and the painting is just off in the far corner compared with whether you are standing directly next to it and actually the artistic work is taking up most of the image and that's the clear purpose of the photograph. One scenario would clearly be incidental, the other would not. Therefore the defence for incidental inclusion would most likely fall away in the latter scenario. And then with no defence to copyright infringement of the artistic painting hanging on the wall, we now have the scenario where you have a photograph of the painting hanging on the wall, albeit you are included in the photograph. So in this scenario, whilst there will be copyright subsisting in the new photograph that's taken, permission would also be required from the owner of the copyright of the artistic painting hanging on the wall. That is, so long as copyright hasn't expired. And notwithstanding that written advice on such an issue could run into several thousand words or more, the basic position as we currently stand is that copyright lasts for the lifetime of the author plus 70 years. And finally there are some instances where permission to use an image is not required. One of the simplest forms is sharing a link to an image that's already been published. The courts have said that internet users should be free to do so. You will also not require permission if it is non-commercial and for research or private study. Another exception is for criticism, review and quotation but you must ensure that your produced work is a new work and not just a substitute for the original, otherwise this defence is going to fall away. And the same of course applies for parody and pastiche, where a new work is created and derived from an original work but in the format of parody and pastiche. But otherwise where you're seeking permission to use an image, I would urge that you look very carefully that the website telling you that you can have permission to use the image is actually accurate and from the copyright owner. And as it happens this is particularly relevant with music sources when using those alongside a YouTube video for example. You should also be mindful that when you upload images to a social media platform that you're not inadvertently giving away lots of rights in the process. For example on the 5th of April 2017 Facebook updated its terms and conditions to include the following. Following the change, when you upload copyrighted images to Facebook, you are granting Facebook a non-exclusive, transferable, sub-licensable, royalty-free, worldwide license to use your intellectual property in the image. And as an important twist, this remains in place for as long as that material is on Facebook, irrespective of whether it was uploaded and shared by you or reposted by other people. So with that said, I hope you found this video of just some of the copyright aspects for images interesting. Thank you for watching, make sure you subscribe and I'll see you next time.